Okay. All right. <laughs> you don't get introduced uh, like that normally, you see. He, he's the master of introductions. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you, you are amazing. At least all the blokes are amazing. <laughs> Because, uh, no, because, you know, girls not interested in state of origin, are they? Well, you're amazing too then. You've made a decision tonight to come here rather than stay at home and watch TV. Isn't that, isn't that something? Congratulations. The good news is, if I've got this worked out right, that because it's in Adelaide and Adelaide's a half an hour behind us, that means you can probably get home and see most of the match. Yeah, Pastor Matt, he said, he said he was really struggling with it this afternoon. Will I go to the meeting or not? And then he felt, he felt really bad because he hadn't been to the last two Wednesdays. He thought, I better show up, you know, just to just make it look like I'm, I'm not backslidden. So he, he's all right, he's all right, but he's going to be in a hurry to get home, I tell you. <laughs> all right, all right. I've just got to make a couple of announcements. Firstly, uh, I've been talking about uh, getting you some notes especially of the last of tonight and, and last, uh, last Wednesday night, what I'll do uh, is put them on Facebook tomorrow afternoon. And so if you want to go on Vince Esterman, my, my English page, uh, I'll, have, um, I'll have the notes of last, uh, last week and, and tonight uh, on there so you can then print it out from, from there. I think that's better than, than distributing a, a sheet of paper. I didn't know how many would be here. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing, for those of you who haven't come across my books yet, uh, Denise has, has got a stand all set up uh, at the entrance. I know that, um, that the, front, uh, the front roller door gets closed pretty quickly on a Wednesday night, um, and so we head off that, in that direction. But if you're interested in the books, please head off in that direction, then go down in that direction. All right, well, that's all I had to, to say. Um, before we started, we're talking about the call of God. Um, you get different approaches to this subject, the call of God. Uh, sometimes people will emphasize the fact that we are called to a state. Uh, we are called to, to um, a position in God. And, and that's, that's true as well. But I'm going to base myself, and I've been basing myself the last two weeks, on a verse of Scripture that is well known, but has consequences for us tonight. And that is Romans 8, 28. And it speaks about the calling. But it gives us a detail about the calling. And it says this, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We're just not called to a state. We're called to a purpose. There is something to do about this call. Um, to not do anything about it is to refuse the call. Uh, so here we are, uh, we've got a purpose. God has got a purpose. We are called into a purpose. It's something that we've got to do. It's something that, that happens. Um, the, the, the issue that we looked at, and, and it was Warren a couple of weeks ago around the communion table, he talked about a jigsaw puzzle. And he said that how you need the whole picture on the, on the cardboard box that will help you work out where each individual uh, piece will fit. And without the bigger picture, uh, many of the pieces will just be unrecognizable. And, and this is what we need to understand, that, that you don't, your calling does not stand alone. We're not individuals all called individually. We're all called into a common purpose. And let's not be complicated about this. The purpose, the big picture, it's very simple. God's determined purpose is that um, men and women that walk the earth will be saved and will go to heaven and share his glory for eternity. It's no more complicated than that. That's the big picture. We are called into that big picture. We are called into that purpose. And so we find our, our, our sphere of work, if I can put it that way, our, our involvement in the kingdom of God in that bigger picture. To help us understand our calling, to help us identify it, to help us respond to it, we started looking last week at Paul's response to his calling. He had a very specific call when he was uh, uh, saved on the, the road to Damascus. 
Jesus spoke to him audibly and told him that he had been called to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to bring them out of darkness. Uh, that's in Acts 26. He had a very clear calling. Um, we perhaps don't have uh, that sort of experience of Jesus where he actually speaks to us directly, uh, audibly. At least if you've had it, then let me know what the key was because I wouldn't mind having it as well. But uh, to this point, I have not had Jesus speak to me audibly. He speaks to me out of the Word and, and through His Spirit, of course. Um, and so we have Paul that has responded to this specific call that was a call of seeing people saved, of seeing people brought out of darkness, and, uh, and his response to it is going to help us to identify what our calling is and how we can respond to it. And so there are 10 lessons that we, we learn from Paul's response to his calling. We dealt with four of them last week, um, and you'll find them in the notes if uh, you want to catch up on them. Uh, the first one was that a call needs a strategy. It needs a plan. It's not something that is just uh, um, nebulous. It's, it's not something that is just, a, um, uh, how can I say, um, something that doesn't have shape. That it's, it's, it's kind of like a mystical thing. I've got a call. Yeah, but what is it? What are you called to in the purpose, in God's purpose? Um, and so to, to fulfill that, then Paul uh, had to set a plan in motion to reach the Gentiles. And we saw last week that Paul had a very specific strategy to reach the Gentiles. And that was wherever he went, he would reach the Jews in the synagogue. And we have verse after verse in the Acts of the Apostles that wherever Paul went, he would immediately go to the synagogue. And what would happen to the synagogue amongst the Jews would then overflow into the city, and that's how he would reach the Gentiles. So that was his plan, and he worked that plan. And I'll have a few more things to say about that, that plan. So that was the first thing that we, we saw, that you need a plan so that your call can uh, take on flesh and blood. Um, the second thing is that we discovered that uh, you can begin to understand what your call is because your background is something that you did not choose. You have a God-given background. And perhaps you've regretted the background you've had. Um, but actually, the background is something that God gave you, and it can be a help to understand how you can um, respond to God's call. So I think it's important to have a look at what background you've had. What, what were your parents like? What was the social setting that you had? The level of your education? Uh, all of these things uh, will weigh in ultimately um, in, in the call. Um, an example was that um, uh, I, I was um, spent a bit of time, quite a bit of time actually, in studying. And, uh, and so um, the fact that I've got a background in studying um, meant that I felt very comfortable with people who are in that sort of sphere. Intellectuals, professors, they don't worry me. Uh, I've dealt with a lot of professors and, and, uh, and university students and that. Uh, why? Because it's part of, of my background. But for somebody who's never done any study and he's confronted by a tall professor or something or other, uh, he can be totally intimidated by that. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So go looking into your background, something that you didn't choose yourself initially, and have a look what's there. That could be a very good indication of how God may want to use you uh, in the years ahead. The third thing that we looked at was that we have to play to our personal strengths. We all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And uh, you can respond to your core not by trying to work on your weaknesses, but especially in using your strengths. And your strengths can be your personality. Uh, one of Denise's strengths is the ability to listen. Uh, it, it really uh, comes in very handy when you're married to a listener and you're a talker. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know that there'd be too many ladies that would be prepared to do the listening that Denise has done over all these years. But that is a tremendous strength for Denise. Uh, and she needs to play, and she, she plays on that. As, and, and sometimes on a Sunday, I've got to draw her away. You might think I'm rude, but I, I just know my wife. She'll still be here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon if I don't say, eh, Denise, we're going to get going. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a strength. Do you, do you understand that? And, uh, and so what are your strengths? Strengths are also uh, your temperament and your personality, but it's also your, your professional um, uh, competence and your experience. That's part of your strengths as well that, that you, can, you can draw on to be able to respond to God's calling. So again, it's not a question of doing some deep introspection. You often find that people will help you know what your strengths are when they say, when you did this, that was a real blessing to me. Well, when they, when they say that to you, they're telling you what your strengths are. You see, Because you will be a blessing to other people when you're operating out of your strengths. And people will reflect that without realizing how important that is for you to know what, what, uh, what uh, you're saying about you or what they're saying about you. The fourth one that we looked at last week was that your First experiences, um, because God is a God of first fruits, uh, who invests in the firstborn, then the first experiences, again, that you did not necessarily choose, will ultimately uh, give an indication of how God wants to use you in the years ahead. And so go back over your first experiences of serving God, your first experiences of reaching out to people. I, I gave you the illustration of, uh, of when I was a university student here in Brisbane, and uh, I was sit, sitting around. I was, I was hearing preaching and the preaching of the gospel that was inspiring me Sunday after Sunday, and I could not just sit around on a Saturday night and not do anything about it. And uh, without anybody suggesting it, or it wasn't part of a church program, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something I was asked to do, uh, I just got my guitar and I went into King George Square and I found the young people hanging around King George Square under the trees, because there used to be trees in King George Square. And, uh, and I would gather them and say, hey guys, I, I want to teach you a song tonight. And I'd teach them a song that I'd learned on the Sunday and I'd talk around that song and then I'd try and bring them to church on the Sunday. And I thought, why did I do that? Why did I do that? It was in me. It was something that was, that was driving me to do it. And it's only when I look back and say, why did I do it, that I can say, because that was part of what I was called to do. See, it was in me already. And so what were my first experiences of serving God and, and reaching out to people? That can be of help to you. Okay, so now we'll pick it up, and we've got six to cover tonight. And uh, then we can let Matt go off and watch the State of Origin. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, no doubt, no doubt. The fifth one is identifying and targeting um, your people group. You are not called to the whole wide world. You are specifically called to a people group. And um, when you can identify the people group, it'll already automatically answer a lot of questions. See, I'm talking, I, people often say, you talk a lot about Denise. Uh, yeah, she's a good example. <laughs> I, I, I know her well. Um, but Denise has got a people group. And she's had it for years. And her people group is children. I mean, it's children. Everywhere she goes, it's children. And uh, so when she wants to go to a conference, what kind of conference does she go to? Children. Children. Does she go to uh, uh, how to minister to Muslims? No. We'll leave that to someone else. Does she go to uh, how to uh, help people with drug rehabilitation? No. She'll leave that to someone else. She's into children. And when, when you know what your people group is, then that will already uh, orientate you um, as to what you need to do to equip yourself to do it. You know, at home, we've got so many books on children, libraries. You open the cupboard and all this children material falls out. It's children. <laughs> you see, 
mass people group. It, it's, it's just so clear. It comes out again. The last, the least, and the lost. All the time, man. And this church is, is marked by that. Because the pastor's people group will be a reflection, will be reflected in the church that he leads, and 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 we've got so many examples of that. And Friday is the big day where the last and the least, uh, and the last, the lost, and the least really get targeted, because he knows his people group. It would be not possible for him to be in a ministry and not to be targeting the last, the lost, and the least, the last, the least, and the lost, uh, whatever the order is. Um, you see, so. So, so that's, that's, what is your people group? What is your people group? For some people, it'll be young people. For others, it'll be older people. Some people will be business people. Some will be, will be sports people. Some will be students. I mean, all of these are people groups. And when you start getting one of those groups in your heart, then you see them everywhere. Everywhere you go, you see them. That's all you see. Because what? It's, it's a calling. And, and you become a specialist in that area. And we, we do need to be specialists. It doesn't mean that you exclude everybody else. Of course not. But it does mean that, um, that you are learning how to reach them, perhaps in a way that other people wouldn't learn. See, it's like it's, it's being focused. It's understanding what the end game is. Um, if you are in Brisbane and you, you want to go to Sydney, you don't have to stop at a sign that says Darwin and sort of think, should I be taking that road? You don't have to because you can't get to Sydney via Darwin. Not in the time you want to get there. <laughs> you see, so that already answers questions, doesn't it? If you know that you want to get to Sydney and you get to a sign that says Darwin, you don't even have to ask yourself the question. You don't get to Sydney via Darwin, you see? And so this is why the whole question of, of people groups are, are really important. Paul understood who his people group was. He had a very defined people group. Now let's have a look in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, where Paul talks about his people group. Uh, he says this, But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's to the non-Jews, that's to the Gentiles, just as, as Peter had been to the circumcised. So they both have clearly identified their people group. And uh, just as well that the Apostle Paul had his people group, the Gentiles, because we wouldn't be around here worshipping God if, if the people group that Paul targeted uh, or weren't included in God's salvation plan, which it wasn't in the initial stages. Um, even Jesus was surprised that the uh, non-Jews had more faith that, than the Jews in the whole of Israel. A Roman centurion and a woman from Cana, from a, a Canaanite woman. Uh, and, uh, and, and Jesus was surprised. He said, but, you know, it, it's not proper to, 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 feed, to feed the children's bread to dogs. Jesus, I don't believe you said that. But even you, you see that the effect, of, and I'm, I'm getting off the track here, but, but you, you see how a Roman centurion and a Canaanite woman had an effect even on Jesus' understanding of his own role. Yeah, yeah. And then Paul, he had a very clear understanding. And he's the one that broke right through so that salvation was not just for the Jews. It was for Jews and for Gentiles. And Paul majored, he who was a Jew of the Jews, Hebrew of the Hebrews, he says, but he was sent to the Gentiles, very clearly, as Peter was sent to the Jews. So this question is a very practical one, isn't it? I'd like you to make that a, a prayer subject. If you're not clear, and that doesn't mean, and I have to repeat that again, it doesn't mean you're not interested in the others, obviously. But it does mean that you've got to be a specialist in the area that you feel particularly called to. And you've got to study up on it. You've got to talk to people who are involved in that sort of ministry. Uh, you, you've got to uh, go and hear messages preached on that. Uh, check it out on YouTube. Go and look at Facebook pages uh, so that you can familiarize yourself with ultimately the calling to the purpose. All right. 
Then the next one I'd like to deal with is the lessons learned from Paul's response to his calling is that Paul had a go anywhere strategy, what I call a go anywhere strategy. It was a strategy that he could apply really across the board. It was broad based. Uh, why? Well, because this, this, the, the question of the synagogues was his entry into whatever society he found himself in. Throughout the whole of the first, the first century Mediterranean world, there were synagogues in every city. He was in a synagogue in Jerusalem, but when he went to Athens, I mean, Athens is, is at that time, it was a long, long way from Israel. But when he get to Athens, Athens, the Athens, in Athens, it was the Greeks. And the Greeks were the philosophers. It wasn't Jewish people that had been brought up with the Old Testament. So how's he going to get a foothold into the, into the Athenian society? By the synagogues. So he'd go to the synagogues, and there he's got Jewish people. And, and, and so he preaches to the Jews, and then what happens in the synagogue then spills out into, into, uh, uh, among the Greeks. I'll have a, something more to say about that in a moment. But then he goes to Rome. And once again, his whole approach is, let's go to the synagogue uh, and do some work among the, the Jews that will allow me then to reach the Gentiles. You see, and so um, this, our strategies need to be applicable easily everywhere. Um, the, the New Hope strategy of taking food to those who are, are less privileged than us and with the food that we take, we give them a two-minute gospel, uh, gospel message. Now, that is wonderful. I don't know of any other church that distributes food that gives everybody a two-minute two gospel message. Uh, there may be some. Perhaps you're aware of them, uh, uh, Matt. But I, I'm not aware of it. I mean, there are a lot of churches that are distributing food. There are a lot of churches doing that but very, very few, if any, actually use that opportunity on the footpath in front of the trucks before anybody gets any tucker, <laughs> if they get spiritual food. Yeah, brilliant. And that means you could do that anywhere. You could do it in Brisbane. You could do it in Sydney. You could do it on the Gold Coast. You can do it on the Sunshine Coast. You can do it in Toowoomba. You can go anywhere and do that same thing. It's a go-anywhere strategy. Brilliant. I don't know if, if it still, still exists today, but in, in our day, <laughs> talking like an old fella, but when we were a lot younger, uh, it was all a rage in the summertime especially to have beach missions. Do they still have beach missions? They do? I'm glad about that. That is a fantastic strategy. It's a fantastic strategy. Why? There are beaches everywhere. Beaches everywhere. You go to the Sunshine We had a family do just two Sundays ago up on the Sunshine Coast, and we just went along some of the beaches. There's, there's King's Beach and Bell's Beach and Dickie's Beach and, and Bullcock Beach and so many beaches. Beaches everywhere. It's Australia. Beach mission. Smart. Good move. And uh, in the summer, when the weather's good, where do all the people head? The beaches. Great. Right, and um, when the kids are on a beach, do they just sort of lie on the sand and sunbake? No, that's the oldies that do that. <laughs> the kids, they want to do things. They're looking for activities. Wow, you've got a captured audience there. And the parents, they're delighted because if the kids are occupied, they can just lie on the beach. See, so that's great. It's perfect. And, uh, and then parents always show an interest in what their kids are doing. So they come around as well. So you get to the parents as well. Brilliant. You see, it's a good go anywhere strategy because you can apply it anywhere you go. See? But it's not like a, a, a young lady that was in our church in Paris and uh, she came up to me. She was a bit of a dancer. And uh, she, she came up to me one day and she said, uh, 
Vince, um, I, I'd like to evangelize by dancing. Oh, okay. So um, what's the idea? Uh, you got to go out in the street and dance? Oh, no, she says. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Oh, okay. So where do you want to dance? Oh, well, in a meeting. Oh, so you want me to organize a meeting so that you can dance? She says, yep, too complicated. Well, you know, I, I really commend her for her, her intention and her desire to evangelize, but her strategy is all wrong. It, it's so complicated that it's not possible to do it. We would have had to hire a hall, and we had to distrib distribute brochures and then get everybody to come and, uh, uh, shh, no thanks. Do something else, like hand out a brochure or something. <laughs> so, so you've got to be practical about these things. Now, if, if you're going to set a strategy and you need to set a strategy to respond to the call, then make sure it's something that you can apply simply everywhere or in most places. All right. Number seven. Get ready for opposition and testing and failure. That goes with the territory, folks. You start to evangelize, it's risky business. You have some people that think it's wonderful and some people that don't like it at all. And if you're worried about that, then you won't evangelize. You do it, if you're evangelizing, then you've got to toughen up a little. You can't just fall in a heap first time somebody abuses you. First time something goes wrong. You know, I've, I've spent so many years over the years on the streets. I've only been beaten up once. Have I told you about that? In Ipswich. In Ipswich. I, 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 think I, I think I told you. I've only been beaten up once. I mean, I've, I've come close a few times. <laughs> but I've only been really badly beaten up. And uh, I'm... I'm ashamed to say that it was by a 16-year-old girl. <coughs> yeah. Um, I, I went, I was going out on Thursday nights and uh, the late night shopping in Nipswich uh, Centre. And uh, it was quite late that night. I, I stayed around for quite a while and, and, uh, and I found a guy sitting on a bench outside the post office in the centre of Ipswich, if you know where you know, the, 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 the hill that, that uh, in the centre of Ipswich, and he was sitting out the post office, and I thought oh, I'll talk to him. So I sat down and I started sharing with him, and he was really open. He was really open. He was listening to what I was saying, and suddenly the girlfriend turns up. Well, she could see that the boyfriend was getting touched, and that didn't suit her at all. And her eyes just turned into flames of fire. I mean, it was just demonic. And she looked at me and her eyes just stuck out and they were flaming red and she just laid into me. I was sitting down and she just laid into me like this on my face. Bang, bang, bang. And she had rings on her fingers and she was cutting me up. <laughs> and I thought, am I going to hit her too? I better not do that. It might be a bad testament, you know. <laughs> Pastor knocks out a 16-year-old girl. Mm. You know, so, so that's no good. Um, so I, I took it. You know, next day we had a baptism service, <laughs> and I turn, and I or, or, or on the, on the Saturday we had a baptism service, and I turn up to the baptism service all cut up, you know, and I said, "What happened to you?" Well, I got beaten up on Thursday night, and they said, "Oh yeah, how big was he?" <laughs> Sixteen-year-old girl, guys. <laughs> yeah, but the following Thursday I was out again, and a few of the uh, Aboriginal guys, young young guys, and they said, "Hey, bro, hey, bro, we saw it happen last week." You're a good guy. And I thought, they were looking. They were looking to see how I was going to handle it. You know, I'm, I'm not suggesting you're going to get beaten up. But I, I am suggesting that somebody may not be pleased about you evangelizing. And, and you've got to just wear that. Um, it's not because we're unwise. If you're unwise, you went looking for it. 
if, if you're provocative unnecessarily, then you go looking for it. But if you do it in a, gen, a gentle, gentle, sorry, in a, in a, in a genuine approach, uh, respectful of the person, wanting them also to be involved in the conversation, not just sort of hammering them, uh, then, then you'll, you'll find that uh, a lot of people will be responsive, but some will object to it. And you've just got to accept that. Uh, if, if, if you think it's you, then just read the Acts of the Apostles. It's not you. It's Jesus in you that they're after. That's, it's the Jesus in you that upsets them, you see. So you, you, you've got to work with that. Paul's, Paul's biggest crisis in his strategy of the synagogue came in Corinth. Because he goes to Corinth. Corinth is in, is in the, uh, um, uh, Greece, not far from Athens. And he goes to Corinth and he goes to the synagogue and he preaches to the Jews. And then there is an almighty opposition that rises up against him. And, uh, and he is hated and he is opposed by the Jews in that synagogue. And Paul is angry. I mean, I don't think that would have been a pretty picture to see the apostle Paul angry. But I reckon he would have really really been angry. He got so angry that he said this to the Jews. Your blood be on your own heads. It was the very thing that they said when Pilate said that he handed Jesus over to them and they said that uh, our blood will be on, 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 our, ha- on, on our hands. Uh, our blood will be on our, or his blood will be on our hands, on our heads. And so Paul he picks this phrase up again. He said, your blood will be on your own heads. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I've had enough of the synagogue. I've had enough of the Jews. I will now go directly to the Gentiles. That is Acts chapter 18, verse 6. Paul had had enough of the synagogue. He was finished with it. He had changed his strategy. Um, and he walks out of there and goes to Ephesus. And uh, now in Ephesus, in that same chapter, Acts 18, verse 19, let's have a look at what happened. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Uh, In verse 6, he'd had enough, and he was going to go directly to the Gentiles, and he was never going to go into another synagogue. And in uh, verse 19... Uh, He arrives in Ephesus and uh, goes himself into the synagogue to reason with the Jews. It's still his strategy. You can get upset. It can go wrong. Uh, It it, it can sometimes not work for you, but it's still a good strategy. And it's not because it's a bit of opposition or it it goes pear-shaped or you get tested and uh, that it's not a good strategy. You just got to wear it, that's all. And once you you got off, you got that out of your system, then, uh, then keep working the strategy. It's a good one. You know, um, I was in Paris one particular occasion and, and uh, every Saturday afternoon I'd, I'd take my sketchboard into the centre of Paris and I'd set it up and uh, not very far from the police station actually but in a very highly um, dense, a very dense uh, crowd uh, every Saturday afternoon in, in the centre there in a shopping area and, uh, and one particular guy got really upset with what I was doing. And he went down to the police station and complained, an official complaint. And so I see these two big policemen coming at me. And they said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I'm relating to the young people and trying to help them get some few, a few values in their lives. And they said, you've got no permission to be here. Who are you? Show me some identity. They wanted my identity card, showed them my identity. They took my name, my address, details. And they said, if we see you here again, we will confiscate your material. Right. So I packed up, went home. I wasn't happy. The niece, when she sees me like that, she leaves me alone. She leaves me alone for three days. I'm allowed three days. 
That's, that's how it works with us Christians. You see. You're allowed in the tomb for three days, then you've got to rise again, you see. <laughs> so if you're having a bad time, you're allowed three days, and then we want you to resurrect again, okay? And so after three days, you know, I've seriously thought that this was going to jeopardize my work in the center of town. I really did. And uh, when I calmed down after three days, the following Saturday, I put my stuff in the car, drove down to the center of Paris, parked the car, got my stuff out, went back to the same spot. Yeah. Only this time, I crossed over to the other side of the road. And on the other side of the road, it was a different police precinct. I had a much bigger crowd around my sketchboard. And there on that side, the police left me alone. And I just was able to continue. So you don't get disappointed. I mean, you get disappointed, of course. You, you want it always for people to sort of thank you for it and think it's wonderful and everything else. But when it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean that the strategy, you've got to change it. It just means you've got to work it a little differently, tweak it. Okay, so just it, failure, testing, or opposition does not mean that your strategy is not good. It just goes with the, the, the fact that we're evangelizing. Number eight, got three more to go and we'll go quickly in it so Matt can get away. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> Try new things. Try new things. Paul was in Athens, Acts chapter 17. He's waiting for Silas and Timothy. Paul is not a good waiter. He's waiting. On the Sabbath, it was okay because he could go to the synagogue and, and reason with the Jews. But what do you do Sunday through to Friday? And so he's waiting. He's got nothing to do. So he's not going to sit around. So he's going to go down to the marketplace and he starts talking to people in the marketplace. And as a result of that, he ends up surrounded by philosophers and he preaches this fantastic message. Oh, Acts 17, preaching at the Areopagus is just a wonderful, wonderful sermon. If you want to learn how to preach to secular people, then just learn uh, what's the, 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 the way Paul did it in Acts chapter 17. And, and, and so he, he has now branched into something new that he done, it wasn't part of his strategy. Going down to the marketplace, talking to people was not part of his strategy. But he tried something new. Why? Because it was thrust upon him. And, uh, and, and then he found himself among the philosophers, and, and that was new as well. And so uh, Greek philosophers. And so he, he attempted something that was new. It keeps you fresh. When you do something on a regular basis because it's your strategy, from time to time, do something a little different so that you can, um, you can just step back from what you're actually doing and not get into some kind of routine because we, we can get into habits, or not habits, but, but get into doing something just simply because it's that time of the week and I'll be doing it and I've always done it this way and this is the way I'll always do it. Um, so... So it's, um, <laughs> I, at one stage, I was uh, composing some songs that we would, uh, we would do with my, my, my team. I had a, a really good team in Paris of great musicians and, uh, and some great singers. And, uh, and so we would do some of my songs on a visitor's mornings. And, um, and then I was invited to go to a big church in the east of Paris, east, east of France, and, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try out a couple of my songs and see how they go. Well, they loved it. And they said, where's the CD? And I thought, oh, CD. So we produced the CD. And, uh, and then out, out of that, then we're sort of thinking, you know, what could we do with this? And so we had our secretary who was really, really a good kind of agent for us. And she opened up restaurants and piano bars. And, and so we went around piano bars around Paris and sang in secular pa piano bars and, and restaurants uh, we sang my songs that always had the gospel message in it. Well, you know, it was it was an exciting experience. I mean, exciting experience. They would let us into their Saturday night crowd, and uh, they would give us the stage, and we would go, go for it. We had one restaurant just down the road from my office, and he took us on about four times. And uh, it was just, he would feed us, and then he'd say, go for it. And uh, and we did. Well, it was, it was interesting. It was a good experience. I don't know that it really produced much, but it was sure an exciting thing to do, and it just gave me more experience uh, that I would normally not have. So, so if you've got an opportunity 
to do something that you've never done before, then why don't you try? It'll keep you fresh in what you're doing. Then there's number nine. Expect the unexpected. It's the God factor. You see, um, you don't really know what God's going to do. You know, I've just started reading Steve Schiller's book. And uh, he, he, says, he says, you know, everybody else seems to know what God's saying to them. I haven't got a clue. I walk into it, you know. <laughs> and I thought, Steve, I can identify with that. You know, you, you hear some people, you, they, reckon, they reckon they've got God on the screen on, of a morning, you see, and God told, you, told them this and God told them that. And God told, you know, they've got it all there in front of them, you know. <laughs> uh, no, they don't. <laughs> but they think they do, you see. Um, but God is a God who likes surprising us. Enjoy being surprised by God. <laughs> expect the unexpected. It's not always what we expect and plan for and, and think it's going to happen. It's, Paul goes to Ephesus a second time in Acts chapter 19. He meets 12 disciples of John the Baptist. That's already a great blessing. And he's got 12 immediately in a, in a home group. And, uh, and he's sharing with them about the Holy Spirit, and they didn't know anything about it. And then he shared with them about Christian baptism, and they didn't know anything about that either. And so he baptizes them. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then um, he goes to the synagogue and teaches for three months in the synagogue in Ephesus. And then they get kicked out of the synagogue. And this incredible door opens. This guy called Tyrannus. He's got a school, and he says to Paul, hey, bring all your students over here, and you can teach them in my school. And Paul says, thank you very much. And he brings all his students into the school, and for two years, Paul taught his students in that school. Now, for Paul to stay in any one place for two years, it's an absolute miracle. He was always on the go somewhere, and yet God God opened this fantastic door for him. And it says that because of what God did in opening that door to that school, the whole of Asia heard the word of God. Now, how did that happen? We don't get any detail. But you can just imagine that out of that school, missionaries went to the whole of Asia and preached the gospel. And that was what God did that Paul never expected Never anticipated. You see, we can't do without the God factor. And people who try to do without the God factor, they will be working for God, but they will never work with God. And there's a big difference. And you only have to look at institution, religious institutions today. There's a lot of sincere people who are sincerely devoting themselves to working for God, I believed in their motivation. But there is no expectation of God doing anything. It's kind of like, you know, Christianity of the New Testament has been replaced by institutions. You see? And so all we have to do is to serve the institution and we're serving God. Well, you're not. You're serving what man has put together historically because of what God did. Then the institution takes over and says, thank you very much. We know how to do it from here. And then, uh, and then we've got a, a, a church of Galatia, a Galatian church all over again, starting by the Spirit, ending in the flesh. Now, now you know, institutions do a lot of good work. And uh, the motivation, the underlying motivation is to work for God. There's no doubt about that in my mind. But having come from an institution myself, there is no expectation of God doing anything. He's done it. Now, now that is not a way to respond to the call of God. Your call is one with a, a, a God who acts. Now, one of my cherished verses in the Bible is John chapter 5, verse 17. My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. I've appropriated that verse for myself. 
My father is working. I have a working father. I have a God who works. And I myself am working. And Jesus said, I do only the things that I see the Father do. So the Father's doing. And if you're going to do any doing, you've got to do what He's doing. You see, that's the whole thing. It's not you working for God. It's you working with God. And when you're working with God, there are some surprises that are pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. So this is the formula. A winning formula in ministry. God's call, good strategy, give it time, good fruit. God's call, good strategy, give it time, good fruit. Coming to the last one now. Until the race is run. Your strategy will work until the end of your life until the race is run. I hadn't intended saying this, but um, I lost a friend this week, a very well-known friend in Australia, Pastor Andrew Evans. Have you heard of Pastor Andrew Evans? Mm, He's a very good friend. And um, I'm on the point of uh, publishing my autobiography, both in French and in English, and I asked him if he could do an endorsement for me. And uh, he was very happy to do that. And um, that was going back a few, few weeks ago when I rang his wife, Dell, and, and um, she told me that he, he had been doing fine. For the last year, there'd been no major setbacks. And uh, being, being an elderly man, um, do need to check from time to time. And, um, and so it was agreed that, that he would do an endorsement, and I thanked her for it. Um, and then two weeks went by, and I hadn't heard, and, and I needed to get the manuscript out uh, to the publishers. And so I, I rang her, and, and, and she was actually with Andrew, and she said he's had a, he's had a real decline. Sudden decline. I said, oh. And he was actually in a very serious situation. And she put him on. And um, I spoke to him on the phone on Tuesday. But I realized that uh, it was pretty serious. I I didn't get back onto them straight away. But I did text and I found out that he had gone to hospital. So on the Friday, I, I sent Della a text and said, uh, how's Andrew going? Is he out of hospital? And uh, uh, she replied, he's just gone to be with the Lord. But the last thing he did that I'm aware of in terms of ministry was to do that endorsement for me. And his endorsement will appear on my book. Um, Yeah. He's run his race. But till his dying breath, he was always reaching out. Always wanting to encourage. Always wanting to tell someone about Jesus and his love for them. And I want to say to you that, that there will be a final day for all of us. And um, you want to be found to be still running that race when the finish line comes for you. Paul comes to Acts 28. Acts 28 is a remarkable passage. Paul is nearing the end of his life. He's a prisoner now in in, uh, in Rome, he's under house arrest. There's a Roman guard out the front of his place. He can't go to the synagogue. He's prevented from doing what he's always done. And he's not too happy about that. 
And so he takes Jesus' example and he sits and stews on it for three days. That's what it says. For three days he sat in the tomb and said, I can't go to the synagogue. And then after three days, he gets his brainstorm and he says, what if I get the synagogue to come to me? So he sends out word, just keeping in mind that this is the man that actually wrote to the Philippians that he considers having been a Pharisee as dung of no value whatsoever. He sends a message out. Could you please tell um, the leaders of the synagogue that I'm a Pharisee who was raised up under Gamaliel, you know, he's a name dropper to impress them all. And, and so they take this message out and all like, oh, a Pharisee from Jerusalem that trained under Gamaliel. Oh, we must go and find this man. And so they all turn up on his doorstep. He, he invites them all in and he creates his own synagogue in his lounge room. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven. I'm going to shake his hand. Oh, I'm going to shake his hand. They say he's pretty, it'll be pretty recognisable. If, if he's still got any kind of physical traits, then he'll still be pretty recognisable. Because they, they say the fresks, the, the old fresks show Paul to have, to have one eyebrow that goes right across. And, uh, and he, he's actually a bit bow-legged. He was actually bow-legged in, in the fresks. That's what comes across. Um, and so when he says, you know, my personal presence is not very impressive, then he was talking about that probably. Um, but in any case, he's probably got a resurrected body, so that won't help me. <laughs> but I think, oh, Paul, I want to go out with a bang too. I want to go out with a bang. I'm not going to rust out. I'm not going to rust out. You know, just like you, James, you're not going to rust out. 75, you want to start a church? I'll be with you. I'll back you. Yeah. Yeah, to... T- t- Till you've run the race. Till the race is run. It was 1988 and I was having lunch in Sydney with a well-known preacher. And he said something that I'd never forgotten. I wrote it down. He said this. Vince, the only ones who are really successful are those who never leave their original calling. I want to leave you with those words. Identify your call. Work on your strategy. Find your target group. Have your experiences. Run it for the rest of, for the rest of your life. And don't ever leave it. To go and find something else to do. Because that's what you have been called to do. With a holy calling. So that you are called according to a higher purpose, the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Father, tonight I'd like to just pray for Dell, Andrew's wife, Ashley and Russell, and for the Evans family as they prepare to bury their loved one. It's a remarkable man of God that changed the face of Australian Pentecostalism. We thank you for such men and women that you have sent, that have responded to the call in such an exemplary way, an inspiring way. Lord, we don't see ourselves in that same light. But at our level, at our dimension, then Lord, we want to also be exemplary, inspirational for others. That others would look on and say, I want to be a Christian like he, like she is a Christian. I want to be able to say, I want to imitate them as they imitate Christ. Father, when I I look at these good people who have come out tonight and I think of those who are watching on YouTube or who will watch the YouTube video, 
Facebook perhaps. That they might go to bed tonight with a great sense of awe and presence and holiness of it all. Understanding that they have been called to a higher purpose. And that as of this evening, this very evening, there will be a response in every heart so that that calling can be responded to and fulfilled in the lives of men and women who love you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for such an example as the Apostle Paul. And we also want to be an example for others. Amen. Amen. Now, as we do at the end of every meeting, we give you an opportunity if you want to come forward and you need prayer. As I look across the congregation, I think I know everybody here more or less. Um, so I won't invite people for salvation. I think that unless somebody is, is here and you don't know the Lord personally, then you need to come up and get, and get prayer and we will lead you to Christ. But if you do have any needs of prayer at the moment because of what you're going through, then we're here for you. God bless you. Thank you for coming out again tonight. Uh, look out for uh, the notes on Facebook tomorrow afternoon. And a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Vince. And, yeah, we do want to encourage you to come forward for prayer.